next chapter cell physiology now cell physiology is the study of the functions carried out by the structures within the cell these functions include food and energy production as well as synthesis of substances like proteins the raw materials required for these functions are obtained from the external environment during the physiological processes waste materials are generated this waste cannot remain within the cell and has to be removed the plasma membrane is at the heart of this movement of materials in and out of the cell in this chapter we shall focus on this movement of materials in and out of the cell but first we look at the structure of the cell membrane Previously we said that the plasma membrane surrounds the cell and separates the interior of the cell from its environment. This membrane is composed of a bilayer made up of phospholipids. The structure of the bilayer is due to tail to tail packing of the non-polar hydrophobic tails and the polar hydrophilic head of the phospholipid molecules. The membrane is 5 to 10 nanometers thick and is embedded with proteins. Some membranes also contain cholesterol. A plasma membrane contains different types of proteins which are specific to the particular function of the cell. Apart from the cell or plasma membrane, other organelles are also bound by their membranes and all have the same structure as the plasma membrane. The key feature of the membranes is the ability to move materials in and out. Materials move in and out of cells across the plasma membrane through three major processes: diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Diffusion is the process by which particles move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration imagine if a spatula of potassium permanganate is added to water this region here is said to be concentrated with potassium permanganate crystals the rest of the water is said to have a low concentration of the same particles The difference in concentration between the two regions is called the concentration gradient. Accordingly, the potassium permanganate particles will diffuse to the regions of low concentration continuously until all the water has uniform concentration of potassium permanganate crystals. The plasma membrane also uses diffusion to move materials in and out of the cell. Small non-charged particles, primarily gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, can diffuse through the plasma membrane by moving in between the phospholipid bilayer. This is called simple diffusion. However, the cell needs to control what enters and leaves, so transport proteins aid in the selective movement of other molecules across the membrane without any input of energy. Through facilitated diffusion, larger molecules, polar molecules, and charged ions use channel proteins embedded in the layer. Role of diffusion in living organisms. Diffusion is involved in the absorption of materials in plants. Many salts dissolve in water to form ions which are small enough in size to pass through the pores of the cell membranes of the root hairs. This process will take place when the concentration of ions is higher in the soil water than in the root hairs of cells. Digested foods, for example, amino acids and glucose, diffuse across the walls of the ileum into the blood. for transport to other parts of the animal body Diffusion is also involved in gaseous exchange in both plants and animals Plants take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen in the presence of sunlight during photosynthesis 
Some of the oxygen is used in respiration and the excess is given out. At night, only respiration takes place and therefore plants take in oxygen and give out carbon dioxide. These gases pass in and out of plants through the stomata in leaves and lenticels in stems by diffusion. In animals, several structures are used as surfaces for gaseous exchange through diffusion. These include gills, skin, tracheal system, and the lungs. Factors affecting the rate of diffusion. Diffusion gradient. We have already stated that the diffusion gradient is the difference between the highly and the lowly concentrated regions. A greater diffusion gradient between two points increases the rate of diffusion. The rate of diffusion in and out of a body depends on the surface area to volume ratio. The higher the ratio, the greater the rate of diffusion and the lower the ratio, the less the rate of diffusion. This implies that small organisms expose a large surface area to the surrounding when compared to big organisms. Therefore, small organisms depend on diffusion as a means of transport of food, respiratory gases, and waste products. Large animals, in addition to diffusion, have transport systems to increase the efficiency of diffusion. Thickness of the membrane and tissues. The thicker the membrane or tissue, the lower the rate of diffusion, and this is because the distance to be covered by the diffusing molecules is greater. However, if the membrane is thinner, the rate of diffusion is higher. Size of the molecules. Small and light molecules diffuse faster than larger molecules. Temperature. An increase in temperature increases the energy content in molecules and this causes them to move faster. Hence, an increase in temperature increases the rate of diffusion while a decrease in temperature decreases the rate of diffusion. The next physiological process is osmosis. Osmosis is a special type of diffusion that involves a semi-permeable membrane. To be able to understand osmosis, let us first understand a term called tonicity. Tonicity refers to the relative solute concentration of two solutions separated by a semi-permeable membrane. The solution with lower solute concentration is said to be hypotonic and the one with the higher solute concentration is said to be hypertonic. If the two solutions have equal solute concentration, they are said to be isotonic. Osmosis is the movement of solvent molecules, especially water, from a region of low solute concentration to a region of high solute concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. By considering the tonicity of two solutions, you can say that during osmosis, water molecules will move from a hypotonic to a hypertonic solution across a semi-permeable membrane. Osmosis can be demonstrated using a visiting tubing, which will act as a semi-permeable membrane. We take three beakers, A, B and C. In beaker A, we put 100 milliliters of distilled water. In beaker B, we put 100 milliliters of 25% sugar solution. And in beaker C, we put 100 milliliters of 50% sugar solution. Now, to each of the beaker, we put a visiting tubing whose content is 25% sugar solution. We allow them some time. This is what will happen. In beaker A, the content of the visiting tubing is hypertonic relative to the distilled water in the beaker. Water will therefore move from the beaker across the membrane of the visiting tubing by osmosis. 
This will increase the content of the tubing, causing it to swell. In beaker B, the content of the vesicating tubing and the content of the beaker are isotonic, so there is no net movement of water and therefore there will be no observable change. And in beaker C, the content of the vesicating tubing is hypotonic relative to the content of the beaker. Water will therefore move out of the vesicating tubing by osmosis, causing its content to reduce and therefore it will shrink. If this is osmosis. Back to the cell membrane, the inside of the cell has a higher solute concentration or is hypertonic due to dissolved substances compared to the outside. Solvent or water molecules therefore move into the cell by osmosis. And so just like the visking tubing, a cell in a hypertonic environment will have water moving from the inside of the cell to the outside where the solid concentration is higher. In a hypertonic solution, water will move into the cell. When the solutions on either side of the membrane are isotonic, that is they reach equilibrium, there will be no net movement of water in and out of the cell. The movement does occur, but the rates of inward and outward movements are equal. Water relations in animals. The animal cell membranes are semi-permeable and will take in water or lose water depending on their surroundings. When red blood cells are placed in a hypotonic solution, water will move from the solution into the cells by osmosis. This will increase the cellular content, causing the cells to swell. At some point, the cell membrane cannot withstand the pressure exerted by the content and will burst. This bursting of the red blood cells is called hemolysis. If red blood cells are placed in a hypertonic solution, they will lose water by osmosis, causing a decrease in cellular content. The cells will shrink, and this shrinking is called crenation. When placed in an isotonic solution, there would be no net movement of water in or out of the cells, so there will be no observable change. As you can already imagine, body cells must always be in a state of isotonicity with the surrounding fluids so as to avoid influx or outflux of water. And now water relations in plants. If a plant cell is placed in a hypotonic solution, it will gain water through osmosis. However, unlike the animal cells, plant cells contain a cellulose solvent which gives it strength and prevents it from bursting. The vacuole enlarges as it gains water, pushing against the cell wall, causing what we call tiger pressure. If the cell becomes rigid and is said to be turgid. The cell wall on its part exerts an equal and opposite pressure to the tiger pressure, called wall pressure. If the cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, it loses water by osmosis. The cell shrinks and becomes less turgid or flabby and is said to be flaccid. If the cell continues to lose water, its content reduces and the plasma membrane pulls away from the cell wall. This process by which plant cells lose water to become flaccid is called plasmolysis. Plasmolysis can be reversed by placing the flaccid cell in hypotonic solution. This is deplasmolysis. During a hot day, 
the rate of transpiration in the leaves may exceed that of water uptake by the roots. If this happens, there will be a deficit of water in the plant cells. The cells lose their tiger pressure and become flaccid, causing the plant to droop. This is called wilting. It can be corrected by watering the plant. Now we look at the role of osmosis in living organisms. The first one, we've said that the root hair cells of a plant absorb water from the soil by osmosis. This same process, that is osmosis, helps in water distribution from cell to cell in the body. Next, support. Water taken into cells increase the tiger pressure and hence the cells become rigid and therefore gain support. This type of support is important in seedlings, leaves and herbaceous plants which are less woody. Opening and closing of stomata. The guard cells synthesize glucose through the process of photosynthesis in the presence of light. As glucose accumulates in the guard cells, their osmotic pressure increases and this enables them to draw water from adjacent cells by osmosis. This action results in the guard cells becoming turgid, causing opening of the stomata. At night, guard cells do not photosynthesize and therefore glucose levels go down, leading to lowering of osmotic pressure and this leads to closing of stomata. Feeding in insectivorous plants. These are plants that trap insects using special structures that suddenly change their tiger pressure when disturbed. The change in tiger pressure enables the special structures to close, trapping insects which are digested to provide amino acid. Osmoregulation. In kidney tubules of animals, Water is withdrawn from the tubules through the tubular walls through osmosis. Water finds its way into the surrounding blood capillaries. This helps the animal to regulate its body osmotic pressure. Factors affecting osmosis Concentration of solutions and concentration gradient Osmosis is greater in solutions that have greater differences in osmotic pressure. The greater the concentration gradient between two points, the greater the speed of osmosis. Certain factors that increase the rate of diffusion also increase the rate of osmosis, provided they do not destroy the semi-permeable membrane. Such include temperature. The last physiological process is active transport. Now, movement of materials by diffusion and osmosis occur across a concentration gradient and do not require any input of energy. Diffusion and osmosis are referred to as passive transport. However, it is not always that the materials needed inside the cell are lower in concentration than outside and vice versa. When substances need to be driven against their concentration gradient from low to high concentration, active transport is required. This process involves expenditure of energy to move materials across the cell membrane using selective carrier proteins. Examples include the sodium-potassium pump that moves sodium and potassium ions across the plasma membrane. The energy required in active transport is supplied by the high energy molecules called ATP. Role of active transport in plants and animals. Active transport is involved in the reabsorption of sugar and some salts by the kidney. Useful substances are also reabsorbed back into the bloodstream from the kidney tubules by active transport. It is also used in the absorption of some mineral salts from the soil by roots. Active transport is also responsible for the absorption of digested food from the alimentary canal of animals into the bloodstream. 
These are the large molecules that cannot diffuse across the thin epithelium. And finally, it is involved in the excretion of waste products from body cells. And finally, we perform an experiment to demonstrate the occurrence of osmosis in plant cells. We shall use potato strips. We need to obtain 18 potato strips of equal thickness. And then we ensure all strips are of the same length. In this case, we shall cut all of them to 6 centimeters. Now we take six beakers and put three stripes in each of the beaker. This will give us three repeats for each solution we are testing. The next thing is to add water of different salt concentration to each of the six beakers. In this experiment, we shall need six solutions. Zero grams per 100 ml, which is basically pure water, and then an increment of one gram per 100 ml to the other five solutions. Now we pour each of the solution to one of the beakers with the potato strips. We leave them for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, we come back and measure all the strips accurately. One thing you will notice as you measure them is that the ones immersed in more concentrated solutions are softer, while those that were immersed in less concentrated solutions are more turgid. Get a table of values for all the measurements including the starting length. In the next column, we put the values for the final length you measured at the end of the 20 minutes. And then we calculate the percentage change in length. Notice the negative values in some cases. And this tells you that some strips reduced in length. Next, you can take the average percentage change for each of the set of the three stripes. We plot a graph of percentage change in length against the salt concentration. The results show a nice downward curve. The lower salt concentration results in increase in the length of the potato strips, meaning that water entered the potato strips by osmosis, causing the cells to expand. This means there is a higher water potential in the solution compared to the potato cells. It is a hypotonic solution. At higher salt concentration, however, we have a decrease in potato length, meaning that the potato cells lost water by osmosis, making the cells smaller. The solutions are hypertonic relative to the potato cell sap. At the point where the graph crosses zero, which is about 1.4 grams per 100 ml, the solutions are isotonic, meaning the water potential inside the potato cell is equal to the water potential in the solution, so there was no net movement of water. You can also repeat the same experiment, but this time use masses instead of length of potato strips. The graph will appear more or less the same. What about if you did the experiment with boiled potatoes? There would be no net movement of water. Boiled potatoes have dead cells and therefore the plasma membrane is destroyed and there is no physiological process that can take place. 